Hello, this is Brother Bill. I want to ask you a question today. What does it mean to be a Baptist? First of all, let me dispel a common misconception and tell you that Baptists are not Protestants. In the Protestant Reformation, a number of Catholic priests left the Catholic Church in order to try and reform or correct the errors of that belief system and bring it more into compliance with the Bible. The Baptists, however, take a very different approach and always have. They take the Bible and build our belief system off of what the Bible says rather than trying to change another system into something that looks more like the Bible. Our belief system has been handed down to us since the time of the Apostles through groups such as the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Paulicians, the Donatists, and many others, down through the Anabaptists and then finally through the Baptists. And there's been a great price paid for our beliefs and what we, we stand for. Which brings me to what I want to discuss today, which is the Baptist distinctives. What are those teachings that distinctly make us Baptist as opposed to, say, Methodist or Presbyterian or even non-denominational. What is it we believe that is specifically Baptist? Uh, basically, our doctrine comes from the Bible, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today and just share some of the things that make us Baptist so that maybe you'll understand a little bit better what we're trying to preserve here and what we're trying to keep uh, from, from being lost. I hope you'll join me on this journey, and let's dive right into it. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Having proper doctrine in our church and in our life is extremely important according to the scriptures. The doctrines that we're about to discuss are the ones that make us distinctly Baptist. Baptists are a people of the Bible. We study the Bible, we live by the Bible, and our doctrine all comes from the Bible. So let's get started with some of the basics. First thing we have to consider is, who is actually saved? Are the Baptists the only ones going to heaven? Absolutely not. Anyone who puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, repenting of sin and turning to Him by faith, is saved regardless of what name they call themselves by. Just to be clear, that is Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. No works, no sacraments, no other thing may be part of their salvation or they're not truly saved. But if they've truly trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, then they are saved, even though they may not be Baptist. So then why should we be Baptist? Well, simply put, it's so that we can follow the Bible. There is a great deal more in the Bible than just salvation. There is much more to living this Christian life than just getting saved. That's why it's so important to have sound doctrine. There are some clearly biblical doctrines that only the Baptists consistently hold. Other groups may hold to one or two of these doctrines, however, the Baptists are the only ones that consistently hold all of them. And they all are biblical, so we need to hold to them very strongly. So what are the Baptist distinctives? There are certain things that make us Baptists, but let's look at what they are. Our only rule of authority is the Scripture. Church ordinances are Baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe in Christian liberty, that is the freedom to choose Christ. We believe that the church is a local, independent body of baptized believers, and we believe the only biblical church officers are pastors and deacons. So the first distinctive is our rule of authority, the scriptures. During the Reformation, many of the reformers had a saying, sola scriptura, which is Latin for scripture only. By this they meant that they rejected the traditions of the Catholic Church. As Baptists, we go a bit further and say that we reject all traditions and philosophies of men that contradict the Scripture. We believe the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and completely sufficient for all matters of faith. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. 
God literally spoke through the human authors of the Bible, ensuring its complete accuracy in recording his intent and literal message. That is, that every word of God is truly inspired. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We believe that the Bible is complete in the 66 traditional books of the Scriptures, and it is God's final revelation of Himself to mankind. That means there will be no other book, no other testament, no other revelation of God, either in written form or through someone speaking in the church. We do not recognize the Book of Mormon. We do not recognize the books of the Apocrypha. We do not recognize the Koran. We do not recognize any other book or any other writing or any other statement as being from God, only the Bible. Galatians 1, 6-9 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The Bible is our sole source of spiritual truth and guidance for the believer. No decree or tradition of men, boards or councils or anything else, can supersede Scripture. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and they rely heavily on the traditions of men, often granting them greater weight than the Scriptures themselves. Additionally, when the Pope speaks as they call it ex cathedra, when he's speaking as the prophet of God or the mouthpiece of God, that takes weight over any scripture or anything else in their tradition or any other source. We reject anything like that as being unbiblical. We accept the word of God over the word of any man or church tradition on spiritual matters or scriptural truth. For that matter, anything that the scripture speaks on, we accept that over the word of man. God is not impressed by the traditions of man. In Mark 7 verses 6 through 9, the Lord Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. He answered and said unto them, well hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. We don't even accept the preacher's word for it. Of the Berean Christians in Acts 17.11, we read, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Don't take my word for it. Don't even take the preacher's word for it. Go to the scriptures and see what they say. That's our authority. When Paul, the author of most of the New Testament, preached to the Christians at Berea, they didn't even take his word for it. They searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were correct. In finding that they were, they accepted what he had to say. We believe that the Bible is of no private interpretation, which means that we do not need a special priesthood in order to interpret the Bible for us. It says in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Every believer has the ability and responsibility to study things for themselves from the Scripture. God has revealed His Word to every believer, and each of us is responsible to study truth for ourselves. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The New Testament is our sole guide to the operation of the Church. The Church is a New Testament creation of God, and as such... That testament gives us all the guidelines for how the church is to operate. Many groups trust in the wrong things as their authority. They may trust in a person or a group of people, such as the Pope, or Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science. They may trust in personal experience or feelings like the charismatic movement. They might trust in church tradition as Roman Catholicism does. Or they might have other books, non-canonical books, books that are not in the Bible, that is such as the Book of Mormon, the Apocrypha, or the Koran. We recognize only the scripture as authoritative. Next in our study of the Baptist distinctives, we're going to look at what the church ordinances are. They were instituted by the Lord Jesus, and they are baptism and the Lord's Supper. So what are ordinances? 
An ordinance is defined as a rule established by authority, a permanent rule of action, and observance commanded. These are the observances commanded by our Lord Jesus. The only ordinances given in Scripture are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is given to us in Matthew 28:19, where the Lord says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. What is the purpose of baptism? Well, first of all, baptism is the first step of obedience for a new believer. When someone comes to know Christ, they are commanded to be baptized. It follows salvation. We see that in Acts 8, 36 and 37, where it says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Did you catch that? There was a prerequisite to being baptized. He had to believe on Jesus Christ. Baptism is the first step of obedience for the new Christian. If a person gets saved but doesn't get baptized, they rarely do anything for the Lord in their life. Notice also that since someone has to believe before they're eligible for baptism, that means that infants cannot be baptized scripturally. A rejection of infant baptism has always been one of the marks of the Baptist Church. In fact, the fact that we insist on believer's baptism is where we get our name. 1 Peter 3.21 says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but of an answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That verse there is telling us how baptism isn't putting away sin, but is rather a step of obedience toward God. This leads us to understand that baptism is simply symbolic. It is a picture of an inward change. It pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It associates us with our faith in what he did for us. And it also pictures our death to sin, life unto Christ, and the resurrection we'll share with him in glory. Since baptism is only symbolic, it has nothing to do with saving our souls. It is simply a step of obedience that the new believers should take in Christ. We do not get baptized to be saved, but rather we get baptized because we are saved. Again, this makes infant baptism absolutely impossible. To say that baptism is required for salvation is to contradict the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We see that in Luke 23, verses 42 and 43, where he speaks to the thief on the cross. Here we read, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. This man never had the opportunity to be baptized, and yet the Lord Jesus himself said that he would be with him in heaven. Clearly he did not need to be baptized in order to be saved. But then what about Mark 16:16, 16, 16, where it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It may help us to understand the verse by putting it into a different context. It would be similar to saying, He that getteth on the bus and sitteth down shall go to town. He that getteth not on the bus shall not go to town. What is it that made the difference between the two? It was the getting on the bus. The sitting down is just an example of what people do when they get on the bus. Likewise, it's true with this verse. Being baptized is just the example of what people who get saved are going to do. It was whether or not they believe that made the difference between salvation and not having salvation. Romans 6, 3-5 and Colossians 2:12 both show how baptism represents a believer's identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 3-5 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Baptism also brings a new believer into membership with the church. Acts 2.41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. These people believed on the word that Peter was preaching, they trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and they were baptized, and they were added unto the church. Baptism also represents a public testimony for Christ. Matthew 10.32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. It is necessary for us to have a public testimony for Jesus Christ. Baptism is a testimony to the church, and if it is done in a public place like a lake or a river, it can also be a testimony to the world. Proper candidates for baptism are those who are truly saved. 
There is no age requirement to be baptized, however, they must have a testimony for Jesus Christ. That is to say that they must be able to give a public witness of their faith in Jesus Christ. An infant, unfortunately, cannot do that. Next, what is the method of baptism? Baptism is always by immersion in deep water by a scriptural authority. We do not find pouring or sprinkling in the Bible, only immersion. Only immersion clearly pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We find examples of this in scripture. In Matthew 3.16, we find the testimony of Christ's baptism. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. In order for the Lord to come up out of the water, he must have been under the water in the first place. Therefore, his baptism was by immersion. We also see this in the account of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts 8:38 and 39 we read, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. This account shows us that there was obviously sufficient water for both Philip and the eunuch to go down into the water. This was no chalice for sprinkling or pouring. This was deep water. We also stated that baptism had to be accomplished by a scriptural authority. Matthew 28:19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That command was given specifically to the church. The Jehovah's Witnesses also perform baptisms by immersion. However, they are not a scriptural authority because they do not believe in scriptural salvation. Only a church holding proper faith and doctrine would be considered a scriptural authority. Additionally, baptisms performed by individuals outside of church and those performed by parachurch organizations do not qualify as scriptural baptism because the authority was specifically given to the church by the Lord Jesus. The second ordinance given by the Lord Jesus in scripture is the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11:23 through 26 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. When the Lord said, This do in remembrance of me, he made it clear that this was a symbolic observance. There is no saving power in the bread or in the cup. It is merely a remembrance of the sacrifice that the Lord has made for us. Salvation comes only through faith in Christ's shed blood, not in the taking of the Lord's Supper. The symbolism of the Lord's Supper recalls the Lord's broken body and shed blood on Calvary. And then it also looks forward as a reminder of his soon return. Again, the observance of the Lord's Supper is completely symbolic in nature, and the elements have no saving power. The bread and the cup cannot save a person's soul. The Lord's Supper, however, does require self-examination. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29 says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Some in the church at Corinth had fallen ill and even died as a result of sin in their lives because they took the Lord's Supper without examining themselves first. The Lord's Supper is strictly only for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Additionally, only those who have examined themselves and found themselves to be right with God should take the Lord's Supper. This includes having been scripturally baptized. If the believer has not yet had an opportunity to be baptized, they may still be eligible for the Lord's Supper. However, if they are simply in disobedience to the Lord's command, they are in sin and should not take it. The elements of the Lord's Supper are the bread and the cup. The bread is to be unleavened bread. We find this in Exodus 13.6. In that verse we read about the Passover. The Last Supper was actually during the Passover observance, and so it followed all the requirements for the Passover. Exodus 13.6 says, Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. The requirement for the bread during the Passover was that it be unleavened. Leaven in the Bible is a picture of sin. And since the bread represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus, it has to be without sin and therefore unleavened. 
The same goes for the cup. The cup is non-alcoholic grape juice. Alcoholic wine is made with leaven, and in addition to that, fermentation is a process of decay, both of which facts make alcoholic wine a completely inappropriate picture of our Lord's blood and therefore inappropriate for use in the Lord's Supper. And that's without going into whether or not alcohol use is actually sin, which the Bible does teach that it is. Ordinarily, these elements are served by the deacons in the church. This was, in fact, the reason the first deacons were appointed. Some churches teach that there is an additional ordinance, which is foot washing. John 13, 12 through 15 describes how the Lord washed the feet of his disciples. Here we read, So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Some take this to mean that the Lord was giving us another ordinance, but it was simply an example of servitude and not an ordinance. In fact, the Lord asks his disciples if they understand the meaning of what he had done. There is nowhere in scripture where we are commanded to keep this as an observation, but rather this is an example that we should follow as each other's servants. What about the seven sacraments? I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and we believed that there were seven sacraments that were given to the church, of which baptism and the Lord's Supper were two. When considering what a sacrament is, it helps to go with a definition that is given actually by a church that uses them. The Roman Catholic Catechism says, A sacrament is an efficacious, that is, it has power to produce a desired effect, sign of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church, by which divine life is dispensed to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. That sounds wonderful, but what does it mean? Well, they believe that they are truly saved by taking the sacraments, that God gives his grace to us through the elements of the Lord's Supper and baptism, that they all play a part in saving our soul, but that is completely unscriptural. Only faith in Christ saves a person. Only repenting of sin and trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ as the only payment for your sin is sufficient to save a person. This concludes part one of our study on the Baptist distinctives. Since we're studying Baptist history, it is important to know what a Baptist is, so I'm glad you came with us on this journey through Baptist doctrine. Part two will be coming soon, and we will cover Christian liberty, the doctrine of the church, and church officers. I hope you'll continue to join us, and if this study was a help to you, please comment below, and make sure you like our videos, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for helping us preserve our Baptist history.